Welcome everyone, uh, Six County Field Naturalist Club uh, December meeting. Uh, my name is Corey Reno. I'm the current uh, club vice president. Uh, thank you for joining uh, our live presentation over Zoom tonight. Sorry, we can't meet in person, but uh, you know this is the next best thing here. So we're trying to keep everybody uh, online and together in some, some way here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's uh, guest presenter, uh, Karen Vanderwolf. Uh, Karen will talk about the Canadian Bat Project a citizen science project uh, she's helping coordinate and she'll give us more details on that. Uh, Karen did her Bachelor of Science at uh, Western University and her master's at the University of New Brunswick. She has been studying bats since uh, 2006 so she I think she knows a little bit about bats. In the past uh, she has worked um, for various organizations such as the New Brunswick Museum, Ontario Parks, Nature Conservancy of Canada, Canadian Wildlife Federation. So Karen is uh, just finishing up her PhD, at, or she's in the process of finish, finishing up her PhD at uh, Trent University. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Karen. And Karen, it's all yours. Okay, uh, so first I'll just start off with some general bat information uh, before going into the bat boxes specifically. Uh, so there are a lot of species of bat in the world, over 1,400. It's the second most species group of mammals, uh, second only to rodents. And there's quite a variety of sizes. So both of these bats that you see on the screen are adults. So the one on the left is a flying fox uh, in Asia. And then on the right is the, one of the smallest mammals in the world, the bumblebee bat located in uh, Thailand. So I, like I said, those are adults. So it's, it's pretty amazing how different they can get. And there are also a variety of colors. Uh, so I really like these white bats. I think they kind of look like Furbies, if you remember those from, I think, the 90s, so giving away my age here. And the lovely painted bat located in Asia. Um, I think this is a great Halloween symbol instead of like the all black bat that we usually see. I think you should adopt this one. The panda bat uh, in Africa, obviously you can see why it's named that. The yellow winged bat, another African species, a really bright, vibrant yellow there. And uh, in terms of what bats eat, uh, there's a lot of bats that eat fruit, uh, exclusively fruit. Others uh, that pollinate, and there are some pollinators in the American South, uh, but mostly they're located in the tropics. And these are important for tequila and a lot of fruit uh, in terms of pollination. Uh, there's also carnivorous bats. So bats that eat other bats, bats that eat like this poor little frog here and other vertebrates. There's also fishing bats. So like ospreys, they will drag their feet through the water to catch fish. Pretty interesting. But something uh, you're more familiar with probably is insectivores. So bats that only eat insects. And that's all we have in Canada, just, yeah. just the insectivores. I'm sure you're not surprised given that we don't have uh, uh, a lot of fruit bearing yeah, it's so trees good, though. around here. Okay. All right. Yeah. Bye. Somebody's not needed. Oh, well. Um, so bats in Canada, we have the migratory bats. So the red bat, I'm sure you can pick out which that one is. Uh, the silver haired bat, and then on the far right is the hoary bat. So that's the largest bat in Canada. And large is relative, like 30 grams maybe. I caught my first red bat in 2019. I was very excited about that. And this is it here. It was a male. Uh, this species is quite uh, interesting because it's actually sexually dimorphic which isn't too common in Canadian bats. Um, the males are more brightly colored. I'm sure you're not surprised for that. So I was very lucky to catch a male and not a female because you can see the really bright coloration here. Oops, a little frozen, there we go. And this is a big brown bat, some one you might be familiar with because it's very common uh, to come into your attic. Uh, it'll even hibernate in attics which is pretty interesting. This one was actually brought into captivity while I was in New Brunswick because it was found flying around a classroom in the winter. Uh, and people, for some reason, they, didn't, they just didn't like that. So, okay, so we took it into our little cage here and fed it mealworms. You can see it stacking down on one there. 
and released it in the spring. Uh, other bat species, the tricolored bat on the far left there, um, the long-eared bat, uh, most familiar with, I'm sure, the little brown bat in the white, black and white picture there, and then the um, small-footed bat uh, on the far right there. So life cycle, these are actually quite long-lived animals. Uh, they can go for 30 or 40 years in the wild. Uh, we're not really sure the maximum lifespan for these just because uh, they were so hard to identify. Like you can't really tell individuals apart unless you ban them in some manner. Uh, this is a big brown bat uh, found roosting under some bark there. Most species only produce one pup per year. Uh, red bats are exception there where they typically produce two pups per year. But uh, you can see these are quite different from mice, which you might uh, equate bats with more than other species. They live a long time. Mice live for like two years. And of course, mice have these big litters where bats are just the one pup per year. So in uh, late May to July, the females form maternity colonies, which is when they uh, give birth to their pups and raise them until the pups can fly. The males are off doing their own thing and don't help at all. Swarming period is mating season. That happens from August to uh, about October, early October, depending where you are. Uh, swarm, we call it swarming because you get these masses of bats congregating at potential hibernacula like caves and mines, and they'll uh, go around to a whole bunch of different caves in an area, um, checking out all the spots for eligible mates. The females actually store the sperm and don't become pregnant until the spring. And then there's hibernation. So during the winter, of course, these guys in Canada, they only eat insects. There aren't insects flying around during the winter. So they have to uh, tough it out for months, six months in Canada uh, without eating. And they do this in, in spots where the temperature does not fall below freezing. You can imagine those spots are kind of hard to find, but caves and mines in Canada, uh, the ones I measured in New Brunswick, for instance, were about five degrees in the winter which when it's minus 20 out actually feels pretty good when we go in there to count the bats. Um, so they can decrease their body temperature to five degrees to that ambient temperature and this saves them a lot of energy over the winter. So they can just live off their fat reserves and they don't have to eat. Um, but of course, uh, this comes with a few costs. Like when they're in hibernation, deep hibernation, they do have suppressed immune systems. It, not that it's uh, not functioning at all, it is. And we're learning more about this as the years go by, but it's certainly not like uh, a euthermic mammal like us when we're active. During hibernation, they tend to cluster. And as you can see here, this is a picture actually from the United States of Indiana bats, which don't occur here in Canada. You can see that they're really tight right up against each other. And, and this uh, is really conducive for disease transmission, of course. Which brings me to white nose syndrome, which you might have heard of. This is a fungal disease of hibernating bats. It only occurs during the winter, so you will never see this disease during the summer or the fall. And it was named, of course, from the white fungal growth that you see on their noses. So this uh, penetrates into the skin, unlike other fun fungal infections you might be more familiar with, like athlete's foot, which only goes on the surface of your skin. But this fungus penetrates into the skin and actually replaces the uh, blood vessels, the muscles. And you can see this would be really detrimental to the bats. So they can't really fly anymore. And they uh, wake up. They can, they can groom off the surface, uh, groom off the fungus off the surface of their skin. Uh, but waking up like that really burns through their fat reserves too early. And the fungus is thought to be originated from either Europe or Asia, we're not quite sure where. It was first introduced or first found, I should say, in New York in 2006, that's the big giant X there, and it spread from there. So it was first found in a, a tourist cave. So potentially somebody had dirty gear from Europe or Asia, came to North America, went into this tourist cave with their dirty gear, unknowingly of course, and introduced the fungus. Uh, it's since spread, you can see almost Throughout the continent, uh, British Columbia and Alberta still don't have it. Saskatchewan doesn't have it. Yukon, none of the territories have it. 
but all the other provinces have found fungus. And of course, you can see in the states there, not all of them, but a lot of them also have it. And this has led to huge mortality of the, in the hibernating bat population. So this is the fungus. Uh, if you're really interested in molds at all, this is what it looks like under the microscope. The threads are the hyphae of the fungus. And then you can see those sort of curved, uh, sort of scimitar shaped spores on the ends of the hyphae. And this is just one of my cultures of the fungus uh, that I grew in the lab. And what these pictures are, are actually histology of bat wings. So on the right, we have a normal bat wing. And what the arrows are showing are the blood vessels and muscle tissue that you would normally find in a bat wing. But on the picture on the left, you have a bat wing that's just completely filled with fungal hyphae. So when it gets infected with white nose syndrome and it's a severe infection, this is what the wing ends up looking like. So you can imagine this is not really functional anymore for the bat, it can't really fly anymore. And it's, the wing is sort of full of holes with the hyphae and it's losing a lot of electrolytes and water. And it's thought they uh, eventually die not only of starvation, but primarily dehydration. So this is a bat I found in New Brunswick in 2011 when uh, white nose first hit the province. And all the little white dots there you can see, that's the fungal growth on the, all the exposed skin surfaces there. So that's what it looks like when it's a very severe infection. And this is uh, uh, showing the sort of damage you get to the bat wing. So the black arrow is pointing towards an area of the wing that's still relatively normal. That's what it usually looks like. And the white arrow is pointing to areas, you can see it's kind of like crumpled tissue paper. It's really been damaged by this fungus. So what do we do? Uh, the first thing people tried to do was slow the spread of the fungus, uh, which can be transmitted by people from cave to cave. So trying to keep people out of caves. Of course, uh, the bats can spread it too. And as you saw from the distribution map, it spreads a lot already. It's almost everywhere now. But it's also good to keep people out of caves in the winter because, well, people like to go in there and have parties and they disturb the bats and throw trash everywhere. So uh, not disturbing the bats uh, during the winter is important so that you don't uh, wake them up too often and they burn through their fat reserves. So it's always good to just stay out of caves during the winter anyway. So what are the consequences of this disease? So in 2012, it was estimated that five to seven million bats in North America had already died. You can see this number is very outdated. Uh, I think they're working on a new number, but it hasn't been published yet. And then of course the economic potential. So bats in, uh, in Canada and most of them in the US as well only eat insects. Some of these insects are forestry pests, agricultural pests. So Answer really is that we don't know because this is all new, which is ongoing. So I just want to quickly go through white nose syndrome in New Brunswick because uh, I was there while it was happening, which was interesting and also really sad. So we went into a cave in March 2011 to do uh, research. And we found, this is what we found. Those are my legs standing there. And the floor of the cave was just covered in bodies. It was uh, really sad to see. This was thousands of bats just dead on the, on the ground. And floating in water, a lot of these caves have pools of water, which is actually good for the bats because then they can drink, but yeah. They, when the bats get this disease, they often move within the cave to the entrance, to the cold entrance environment where there's a lot of ice. Uh, so a lot of the bodies get frozen into uh, the ice areas. And this is just showing the effect on the hibernating bat population in the province. So each line here is a cave, a hibernation site where the bats used to be. Uh, Barryton Cave is sort of um, a dark green. It's hard to see there. But it used to be uh, 6,000 bats 
So it was by far the biggest cave and it was the one to be hit first. So it just rocketed down from 6,000 uh, down to, well, it went to zero actually. No bats are there anymore unless we checked. And uh, one by one, each cave did get infected. By winter 2013, they were all infected. And you can see that the bat population just completely crashed. In some sites, it went to zero. But in um, other sites, did do still have bats in them, which is really great. So there are survivors. Our last count in winter 2015, there was only 13 individuals. That was our total count. So there's certainly not many survivors, but there are some survivors. And I did do some field work in New Brunswick in 2019, and I did find healthy colonies of little brown bats reproducing with pups. It was great to see. Um, so they're certainly not gone. Our initial fears that there'd be um, extinctions uh, have been unfounded, which is great. So when we had all these bodies in the cave, the predators really liked this, or at least the scavengers. We had raccoons going in there and uh, eating up all these uh, bats, a great food source. And other fungi also moved in. So normally uh, with mammals, we don't have fungus going on. Them. We're really resistant to that kind of growth. But once you die, the fungus can uh, readily grow on you. So this is not the white nose fungus that you see growing on these bat bodies. These are other types of fungi. And some of them are quite colorful there. Um, I'm not sure if I can use my cursor to point it out, but anyway, this is the head of the bat. These are the ears here. You can see this lovely yellow growth of one of these fungi. And then the wings have the nice red growth here. And uh, eventually over the years, the bodies of course decomposed. Uh, these are all wing bones here, the sort of straw-like structures that you see. And eventually there was just skeletons left in the caves. So transitioning now to the bat boxes. So something you can actually do something about. Uh, so in addition to being really heavily pressured by white nose syndrome, uh, bats are also threatened by habitat loss. So of course, with urbanization and agriculture, we're removing a lot of trees from the landscape, especially big trees. Uh, so bats like to roost in uh, big hollow trees under bark that's peeling away, that kind of thing. So not young saplings or anything like that. And those sorts of suitable trees are pretty hard to find, especially in some of these urban environments. So the goal of bat boxes is to replace that lost habitat with a uh, new habitat, man-made bat boxes. Uh, this can help some of these endangered bat species that have been really hard hit by white nose syndrome, like little brown bat. And of course, the goal is to maximize their reproductive success. And a good way to do this is to make sure you provide them with warm roofs. Uh, the temperature really matters because if they're not using energy to keep themselves warm, especially the pups, they can put this energy instead into growth. So the, the pups can grow faster in these warm environments. Um, I took this picture in Prince Edward Island. Maybe you recognize the famous uh, red dirt there. Uh, these bat boxes, just looking at them, I wouldn't have said this is the best way to do it because they're so close to the ground, but it's actually a really successful colony of reproducing little brown bats. Uh, I was there in 2019, so that's great. The problem is um, you can also get overheating bat boxes. So of course in Canada, this far north, we've always emphasized that you really want to maximize the temperatures in your bat box. You want it hot but it turns out some of them get too hot. Even in the Yukon, they've documented temperatures above 50 degrees in some boxes, which is really crazy, right? Um, you can actually get mortality events, especially of the flightless pups resulting from these really high temperatures. So in this picture here, which was taken in Alberta, not by me, you can see some of the pups there, uh, which are the hairless sort of bodies there. And what the bats are doing here is they're congregating at the bottom of the box, which is the coolest part of the roost, trying to escape that heat. Now, the adults, of course, can fly away, um, but the pups cannot. And, they, and uh, nevertheless, there have been mortality associated with these really overheating events. So another question I wanted to address with my project is which bat species actually use bat boxes? So in Canada, there are 18 bat species that regularly occur here. 
but of course not all of them use bat boxes. According to research in the United States, 13 of those 18 species will use bat boxes in the US. But this sort of research has never been done in Canada. We do know that little brown bats will use bat boxes across Canada. In some regions, big brown bats will use bat boxes. And in British Columbia, you get Yuma bats, which do not occur in Ontario. So you don't need to worry about those. Uh, there are a few reports of red bats using bat boxes, but uh, that doesn't seem to be a, a regular thing. It seems to be quite rare. Um, according to research in the US, tricolored bats should be using bat boxes, but they, it's never been documented in Canada. I hope I, hope I can find that because the, the tricolored bats have really been hit hard with white nose syndrome. Bat box designs, there's a lot of different designs out there. Um, that picture on the far left is actually a concrete bat box. I don't know if you've ever heard of those. So it's not pure concrete. What it is is a mix of concrete and wood. It's called woodcrete. It's really popular in Europe, but it just hasn't really um, taken hold here in um, North America. It's thought that it, it has a few advantages. Uh, for instance, uh, it's sort of with the concrete, it's kind of insulated from the temperature changes. You don't get as much variation. That particular picture was actually taken in British Columbia. They have uh, several concrete bat boxes there. Uh, there's actually one here in Ontario near St. Thomas, and there's a few in Newfoundland as well. And that's, that's the only ones I know of in Canada, so there's not that many. On the far right there, that's actually a bat condo. There are several of these in Ontario, for instance, Pinery Provincial Park, uh, McGregor Provincial Park, they both have bat uh, condos, and at least the one in the Pinery for sure has bats. I think it has about 100 bats. I'm not sure if the bigger one is successful. But anyway, these structures you can see are a lot bigger than your typical bat box, and they can also hold a lot more bats. Uh, with such a large structure, you get a lot of temperature gradients, so the bats can choose which temperature to roost at, which can really help them in terms of avoiding those overheating events, but also getting the really uh, warm temperatures that they like. In the center there uh, are probably what you're more familiar with, more typical bat boxes, uh, including like the rocket boxes there, which are the long, thin ones. So some of the goals of my project are to uh, find out what types of bat boxes are currently being used in Canada. And when I say used, I mean used by people, like what are people putting up, but also which ones are the bats using? And do the preferred design, the box design, is that, does that differ by species? So do little brown bats prefer something different from big brown bats? And what, of course, what other species are actually using bat boxes in Canada? I'd also like to document uh, the microclimates of these bat boxes, because uh, of course, it's when it comes down to it, it's all about the temperature, right? And, a, and protection from predators. And uh, to find this out on a regional basis. So it's a national project going for two years. Um, and I'm definitely expecting some regional patterns here, uh, since, of course, Canada's really big. And there's a lot of different uh, variations in habitat and climate. Oh, in the picture, I took this in New Brunswick. This was a successful um, little brown bat colony that was reproducing back in 2019. So post white nose syndrome. And uh, I, we actually caught a female there. You see it's carrying a pup that's almost as big as she is. It's actually nursing there. You can see the pup right here with the ears. <laughs> so if you have a bat box or plan to get one soon, um, I'd love it if you could participate. I didn't put the link to the project up here just because nobody wants to type that in. But if you just Google bat box project, um, WC bats or Canadian bat box project or something like that, you'll find our web page with all the information. So to participate, all you have to do is fill out a multiple choice survey I've developed, which asks you about various physical aspects of your bat box, like the design and how it's mounted. And then in the summer, uh, do emergence counts. So on a nice summer evening, and it does have to be nice if it's raining, don't even bother, uh, sit out on a lawn chair and watch bats as they uh, exit the bat box in the evening around sunset and see how many you get. This project is in partnership with Corey Lawson, who's with the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada, and with James Page at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. 
And the log tag there is just the sort of microclimate logger, which measures both temperature and humidity uh, that I'm hoping to use in this project. Um, so people will have to install the microclimate loggers themselves because as fun as it would be doing an epic road trip across Canada, it's not really feasible for me to go around and install them all myself. And I have a lot of people to thank. But other than that, that's all I've got. So thank you for listening. That's, that's great. I'd like to uh, open it up to any questions. If uh, anybody wants to ask a question, just simply either unmute or, or excuse me, unmute your mic or enter it in the chat, and we'll uh, have Karen uh, answer these questions. Um, I have a question. This is it. Just says do Michelle there, but my name is Jean. Um, the hi Karen, thank you. That was very I, I enjoyed that. When you talked about the overheating, is that sometimes a result of the location of the box? Um, like if it's in too much sunshine through the day, or is it just about the bats overcrowding? Well, if you have a lot of bats in your bat box, that will raise the temperature, but it would be more about, um, yeah, the sun exposure and also how big your bat box is. The bigger your bat box, the more of a temperature gradient you're going to get inside of there. And the more likely it is that it's not going to overheat or that All they right. can go to the very bottom where the good temperatures are. But generally it's not gonna be because there's a whole bunch of bats in there because sadly, we generally don't get that many bats in bat boxes. <laughs> So if I'm going to put up a new bat box, um, am I best to not face the southeast? Well, I have I have a choice. I have choices. Um, well, you can put up multiple bat boxes. That's I could put up multiple bat boxes, couldn't I? <laughs> North, south, east, and west. And move around. Because, of course, you know, when they're coming out of hibernation, especially in May, they want hot now, right? And generally, in you know, especially early May, it's not that hot around here. So if they get one that has a lot of sun, they might prefer that in May. But then in June and July, move to a different bat box that's not quite as uh, exposed to the sun. Right? Oh, so it's, okay. So have these different roofs that they can choose at different types, types of year. All right. Okay, thank you. But in terms of like giving advice on how to avoid overheating, the problem, like I said, there's no, there's almost no research on this in Canada, so I don't know how prevalent it is, you know, mm -hmm. what, how big a problem it is. Mostly, uh, we've mostly been focused on too cold roofs, right, and trying to encourage people to really get the sun on it, really heat it up. Um, so that's something I'm really hoping to address with this study. Okay, thank you. We've got a few in the chat here, so. First one is what time of year are the bats susceptible to overheating? Well, again, in Canada, we're not sure, but June and July, of course, is, is the big ones. Another one here. Is there any cure for the white nose? No. Um, now, if you do take bats into captivity and feed them and give them water and that sort of thing, they will recover. But of course, we can't take billions of bats into captivity and do that. <laughs> Right. So, and in terms of finding a cure, like even if, if we had a cure in our hands, like here it is, it's this thing here. Like now, what? What do you What do you do with it? Uh, like, do you go into caves and spray it on bats? Do you inoculate them in the summer? Like, uh, we're kind of seeing that now with the COVID vaccine campaign. Like, how hard is this for doing it to humans, let alone bats? Humans will at least show up at the clinic to get their shot. Bats are not very cooperative, I have to tell you. <laughs> All right. Okay. And we've got uh, one about uh, how successful are bat boxes in suburban areas? They can be quite successful because uh, bats are, are quite at home, really, in urban and suburban areas, especially uh, um, little brown bats and big brown bats uh, are happy to loosen in your house, in your attic. You're, not all species will do that, but those two definitely will. Another one here. I heard to put a bat box on the north side of the tree, but you suggest east or west, uh, if you can clarify that. We are still recommending that you try to uh, increase your sun exposure here, just so you can get the, the nice warm temperatures. We're, again, I'll have to find out if it's getting too hot, depending on where you uh, put it. And I would not recommend putting it on a tree 
um, mostly those boxes don't tend to attract bats uh, because they're shaded. And then of course the branches are getting in the way of them flying into the entrance. Generally bat boxes are more successful when they're mounted to buildings or poles. Okay. Uh, Carl asks, how do we find out the results of your research? Yeah, so of course I don't have any results right now. I have had uh, over 100 responses to my survey so far. Um, of course, the most from Ontario. Um, about 35% of people report having bats and 60% um, have agreed to install a logger, which is great. Um, but of course, I'm not gonna have results until, well, certainly at least a year and probably more like two. Um, so I'll certainly be emailing out the results. I'm gonna to put together newsletters to participants, um, probably very infrequent and unpredictable newsletters, depending when I have enough material. Uh, just updating people on what I've been finding, the results of the study, how, how is this all going and so forth. Um, I'll probably also contact nature groups again, farther into the study, just to sort of update people on what's going on. And of course, eventually I'll be publishing um, a peer reviewed publication of my results. Great. Hey, uh, Linda has a question here. I live near a bush. How far from the bush should I should one place a bat box? You could put it right on the margin as, as long as it's getting some sun. Okay. And Eileen asks uh, if you know of any places uh, that she can get a box. So of course you could make your own or, or if you happen to know a color carpenter, they'll do it. Um, Amazon sells them, uh, Canadian Tire sells them. If you have an outdoor store, sometimes they sell them. It depends on the outdoor store, um, but they're not too hard to find. I know that uh, the Ojibwe Nature Center has often had them for sale as well for those in this area. Okay, uh, Karen asks, if I'm going to make one or buy one, do I choose a certain size? Huh. Yeah, do I choose a certain size? I would go bigger. Bigger is better generally, like at least three to four chambers is, is good. Okay. All right. Any other questions out there? You're welcome to unmute yourself if you want or type it in the chat. Okay. And, oh, and I've got another one here. I've heard that you have to plant uh, bat substance in the bat box to attract them. Is this true? No, that doesn't even work. Yeah, people have said like, oh, so you should smear guano inside or something, but that, it doesn't work. Okay. There's, I'm, I'm afraid there's nothing you can do to attract them except put up a box or multiple boxes. Great. Hi, Karen, it's Karen. <laughs> um, I guess I just want to clarify if to participate in the study, I would need to put a back box up, but I'm and fill in then fill in your survey, but I wouldn't probably get bats till the spring, which is when I would do this sur emergent surveys. Um, are those done on a daily basis or is there like a certain number of emergent surveys you would want? If you want to do it every day, you go for it. Although, like I said, there's no point doing it when it's raining because the bats are super smart and don't come out when it's bad weather. I think they're very, yeah, it's a very good thing to do. Um, but for the project, I'm only asking for a minimum of four surveys through the season. But of course, okay. the more you do, the better the data, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, you only have to do it for an hour at night when, when you can. Uh, right. You can also so shine a flashlight up into the box during the day uh, just to see if you have bats at all. Um, if you do have a colony there, I wouldn't do that every day just because they're, they're not gonna be too happy with you. But uh, you certainly can do that now and then. Uh, in Canada, the earliest you'll get bats usually in your box is May. But I have heard that they, sometimes they will stay there until October, which is kind of crazy to me. Uh, that's really late for them to be out, but mm -hmm. apparently they are. Right. OK, thanks. Um, apparently, uh, Peely Wings also has boxes sometimes. So it's another place to check locally. Uh, Chris has a question here. I have a hydro pole in the corner of my property. Is that a possibility or are companies usually against that? I have no idea what their company policy is, but I certainly know people, multiple people who have done that. So. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Another question here. Where do the bats who are in your bat boxes go after October? 
so after October, of course, uh, like now it's getting super cold and they don't want to be out there uh, when it's below freezing. So the migratory bats, of course, migrate south like the birds. And uh, but the ones that use your bat box, like the little brown bats, uh, go into hibernation. So they go to the caves and mines where the temperature is always above freezing. Okay. Uh, do any animals uh, predate, predate bats, bats in boxes? Sorry. Yes. So that is uh, one of the reasons to put them up high. Uh, is to try to avoid cats and raccoons that can climb up to the box and uh, get the bats. So that's something you want to avoid uh, for sure. Uh, you, you can also get uh, some aerial predators like owls or raptors, uh, but that doesn't seem to happen very much at bat boxes. Usually there's just not enough bats in a box to, to make it worth their while. Uh, raptors and, and owls will stake out caves um, uh, during swarming season, especially. and uh, more in the American South, they do this uh, at sunset. There's actually some really neat videos of this on YouTube of the raptors snatching bats out of the air. Excellent. Okay, uh, looks like a couple more here. Is there a mess if you attach to the house? Uh, the bat, is there a mess coming out of the boxes? Well, it depends how many bats you get. If you have a very successful box, you, you are going to get some guano coming down, but uh, it's great fertilizer if you have a garden. Great. And just to follow up, how high should it be? Generally, we say it's as high as you can, although you might have noticed in that picture I showed you of the boxes in Prince Edward Island, those were like about at my head height, so they weren't actually that very high, but it was a very successful colony, so. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Chris's question was just answered. <laughs> yeah. So Chris was just asking about the guano situation underneath this. His ideal spot is right above his garden. So it sounds like that would be ideal then. Uh, some free fertilizer. Yeah, it's very good fertilizer, lots of nitrogen. Um, the guano itself, it kind of looks like mouse poop. You know, this is huge stuff, so. Right. Okay. Uh, no issues with disease? As long as you don't, you know, sniff it, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Uh, the problem that you're thinking of is probably with histoplasmosis, uh, which is not a huge problem in Canada, although it has been documented here. But that's more of a problem in um, really enclosed spaces with a lot of guano um, that, and you're breathing that sort of in. If you just have a, a bit out of your bat box outside, it's really not a problem. Okay. Any other questions? Again, you feel free to unmute your mic. No, it looks like that's everyone. Um, so just like to say on behalf of the club, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. I'm really interested, I'll probably be putting up at least one or two bat boxes in, in my property here and be interesting to see, I'd love to participate. I'm sure others will as well. So uh, we'll be in touch. Um, we'll, we'll send out the link as well to our members to the uh, to your study if people would like to participate. And, uh, you know, we just really thank you for taking your time to, to take us through this. No, thank you. That was some great questions. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this concludes tonight's presentation. Uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, see you soon. Take care. Uh -huh.